Hello, everybody. It's really great to see you all here. I uh, want to tell a little story first. I usually like to do that. It um, helps me kind of get a little warmed up here. And you know, I told a little backstory last time. I'm not going to tell that one again, because that would be boring. Um, a slightly different one, and that's you know, how I came into the urban ecosystem for, I don't know how, you know exactly when it was. It was like the third, fourth, fifth time. It took a while. And it happened in the year 2020, which was a particularly special year for Urbit. There was this thing that happened, OS1, right? Many of you probably remember it. This launched in about April of 2020. And for me, as an engineer, this was this extremely important moment in Urbit's history because I'd always been really into Urbit, really excited about the prospects of building with this thing, but there wasn't you know, any proof that you could actually build something on this. It took a very long time. And when OS1 launched, it was the first time there was an application that was real. It worked, mostly. It was really impressive that you could finally use Urbit to actually build something. And this was, you know, this was seven years in. And I was not alone in this. There were a lot of people that were extremely excited about the fact that they could finally use Urbit to build something. But, you know, as I was putting this talk together and thinking about this, it begged the question, which is, why? Like, why are people actually excited about building on Urbit? Why not just use the internet, right? What does this thing mean to these developers that are so rabidly enthusiastic about using it to build things? And so I want to dig into that a little bit, the, the underlying motivations behind what makes people excited to use this to build. And I think it's fairly easy to state, but it's not exactly easy to comprehend those reasons. And I think it kind of boils down to this. It's that Urbit makes computers personal again. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, to get into it, we got to talk about a little bit of computing history, right? How we got to the place we did. I'm going to start in about the 80s, somewhere around there, right? This time that was called the personal computer revolution, right? Computers finally got to a point where just about anybody could have one in their home, right? It didn't all happen in the 80s, but it was going that direction, okay? The microprocessor came about, and it made it cheap enough to take what had formerly been a mainframe, this giant machine that had to run in a building, usually only an institution, and you could actually just run it in your home. And so that, all that complexity of mainframe programming, physical complexity, punch card programming began to become something that was accessible to normal people and they could start tinkering and playing. Now, then they began appearing in homes and schools and libraries and workplaces. But in order to do anything interesting with the computer, you had to install some software. Right? You had to go buy it. Right? It was this physical disk. Right? Eventually it was circular. It was square before that. You'd plug it in. You'd install it. And then it was yours, and you ran it, and it was a tool. It was a tool that you could just keep using. Right? You owned that software that ran on your computer. Okay, you didn't really worry about it failing unless you did something to the computer to make it fail and stop working. So you could rely on it. Right? This was a quality of software that people took for granted. It was really the first time we could do it anyway. Well, and then this thing happened. It was absolutely amazing. The internet, right? We could start talking to people in all kinds of ways, right? We could chat, we could post blogs, we could do post web pages. There's a lot of stuff we could do with the internet. We can now communicate with people across time and space. Now, the problem was is that building network software was really hard. Right, this was a new capability, and our mental model of, okay, I'm talking to you, let me just send some information directly to you, uh, it, didn't, you know, it didn't exactly work that way. Right, it was really hard to actually build tools like that. What was actually a lot easier was to tap into the underlying structure of computers, which was inherited from their mainframe days, right, servers. We needed to have some machine that was online all the time, right, often that had, and eventually especially, had better resource capabilities. We would talk to it, and it would talk to people for us. 
Okay? So servers became a really, really big deal. Now, as that began happening, computers were also getting smaller. Right? They turned into laptops. Now we could start carrying them around with us. And eventually into phones. And on this dimension, computing became much more personal because now I already I always had it with me. Like I could always access com access this computer. But you know, there was still kind of a major problem, which is that as we moved into multiple, you know, environments where we access multiple computers, our brain began to split. You know, we had information over here and over there, all over the place. And so we had to keep relying on servers. Right, we wanted to be able to access our information from anywhere. Right, we wanted to be able to access our programs from anywhere. And I don't know about you guys, but I remember hearing about the cloud all the time. Like seeing billboards and airports, seeing them on top of business magazines, everyone was talking about the cloud, right? Everyone's moving to the cloud. Right, the cloud was doubling down on servers and what they did because our communications were getting more and more complex, more nuanced. We needed more and more resources and people to maintain these kinds of things that enabled us to communicate in ever richer ways. Right, that was all good. And you know, now it's all these tools that we used <laughs> have become services. Right? They're things that we rely on every day in our day-to-day -day basis. And they're, you know, we, we don't own them. We don't run them. Somebody else runs them for us. And, and this, this list doesn't really do it justice because we use hundreds of services. We use services to manage our services. Right? And we use a password manager for your you know, bajillion passwords or the passwords you share in your workplace or with your friends. Right? It's kind of a mess, and we all know this. Right? But they're really just, you know, it's, it's just the state of affairs. It's what we've become, become familiar with dealing with. So this is a fact. Right? The internet has become this integral part of our lives. Right? We can't really imagine life without it at this point. Now, I don't mean to hate on the internet. I don't hate the internet. The internet is an amazing piece of technology. It has enabled us to do all kinds of things that we could never fathom doing otherwise. Right? A lot of us met over the internet. That's why we're here. We met, you know, we work in remote workplaces. We have video calls. We chat with our families. Right? We communicate and travel. It's, it's just completely changed the landscape of day-to-day -day life. Right? There's a lot of positive aspects of this. There are also a lot of negative ones. We don't have privacy anymore. Right? Privacy is becoming rapidly a thing of the past. We're just used to always knowing that the things that we write could be looked at by someone. And that's just kind of weird. Right? I don't mean this in like a you know, surveillance state thing, although that is one possible interpretation. It's just weird to have someone snooping in on you. Like it just kind of sucks, and it's weird. And it changes the way that you interact with a computer in subtle ways that I think people don't even really notice. Now, our social lives, right, they're fragmented. And if you have families that are like diehard Android or Apple users and then you're on the other camp and you can't use things that you use with other people and so now you can't talk to them, right, these things are really annoying. And this is just one little tiny example of cases where we have all these different services, these different people that we talk to and they're fragmented, right? Our communications are fragmented. And they're shouting at us constantly. Like they want us to be paying attention because this is the incentives of the people that make them is to have us looking at them constantly. So we can't focus. We're constantly being dragged into all different kinds of places. And for developers, building on the internet just sucks. Like it's, it's not great. It's gotten progressively worse. I talked about this at length last assembly, the fact that building on the internet is this incredible mess of complexity. Right? You have to juggle so many things to build the simplest thing that it stifles the desire to build in more, in, you know, in more cases than not. And that's bad. We all suffer from that. Like, we want people to be able to build all kinds of fantastic weird things. You know, the other aspect of this is that you know, as technology becomes more complex, you need more and more people in the middle in order to manage it. You need content moderation teams. You need DevOps teams. You need all of these different managers in order to keep things running that ideally would be solved by technology so you didn't have to have people in the middle managing these, these minutia. 
So, oh, that jumped around a little bit. Computing isn't personal anymore. Right? We don't have the same relationship with computers that we did back in the 80s when these were these little tools that we could play with. Right? We're increasingly dropped into these environments that we don't have much of a relationship with. Right? And that make having a relationship with the people that we meet in them strange in weird ways. Right? It's not a bicycle for the mind that it was promised to be. Now the thing is, like as much as technology has changed our lives, we can change the technology. Like we actually can build these things differently. It doesn't have to be this way. Like we can keep the ability to do the things that we love, but we can get rid of the things that we really don't and we'd rather not have. Hey, that's kind of cool. <laughs> Everyone down there is like, what? <laughs> I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, amazing. So, okay, this is. Wouldn't it be nice hey, if our conversations that we had were just between the people that we wanted to talk to? If our digital lives weren't fragmented, if they just didn't have to be? If we could actually focus again? Right, if building software was actually fun for the people that build it? It felt like play again, an exploration. Wouldn't it be nice if our services became tools? And if computers were personal again? Herbert fixes this, right? You see this phrase all the time. It fixes a lot of things. I'm not gonna tell you how. Right? A lot of words have been spent on the subject and the great thing is, is I don't have to tell you how because all these people are about to show you. Right? You're, you're not going to be able to come away from this not understanding exactly how, in some way, this fixes the current state of affairs. So, I want to pop back up the stack, back to 2020. Right? Now you know why I was excited to use Urbit to build things. Right? And why so many other people were excited. Right? It fixes these huge gaping problems with our technological landscape. And I wasn't alone. So what I did is what I usually do. I jumped into the technology. I started learning it. Flan was running Hoon School at the time. I learned the language. And I figured, OK, if I'm going to actually learn this language, I have to build something. Like, I can't learn from a tutorial. I've got to go and actually figure out something I can make and then try and do it. So I got into a group using OS1. It's a developer group. And I popped into a chat and asked, hey, does anyone want to build this with me? And I swear it took no more than like two minutes for some guy to pop in and say, sure. And so I sent him a DM. We started talking there. We hashed out a plan. We started getting on a call every week. And before very long, this guy absolutely ran circles around me. I could not keep up with him. He was incredibly talented. He built this thing in a couple of months with me just kind of acting as a product manager, not totally useful. Um, I was an accountability buddy. Like I got on the call with him, we checked in, weighed in a little about data structures, but the project kept moving. And at one point through this, you know, my mind went from how can I build things with Urbit to how can I get more people to build things with Urbit? Because if it was so easy to find this one guy, it took two minutes with a simple question, like how many more people are just waiting around waiting for someone else to pop in and say, hey, can I, uh, you know, you want to build this thing? It would just jump in and start doing it. So I, uh, I called up Galen. We had a number of conversations. And to make a long story short, we decided, uh, well, you know, I was asked, like, hey, do you want to just like, help us run this Urban Foundation thing? Right, with this mandate to take the community and activate it and take all of this enthusiasm and energy and turn it into productive effort building Urban. 
Okay, so I did that for a little while and we ran into this little problem. Uh, not very long, which is that Urban had no conception of an application. Like you couldn't actually just build something and then get it to people to go and install and use, which is, you know, a little snag. It was a known problem. It was a, you know, deprioritized problem until there was actually enough people that were excited to build things and now we had them. So I worked with this team at Talon over the course of most of last year to eventually release software distribution at assembly. Right, if you were there last year, you know this was kind of our, our big announcement. And Galen gave this talk, right, about our community going from this community of enthusiasts into a community of people that were enthusiastic about using Urbit to build what they wanted to build. Now, we thought at going into this that you know, software distribution is what's going to allow us to go from being this community into what's, you know, we'd call an ecosystem. Right? In biological terms, an ecosystem is this chain of interactions between organisms and environment that, you know, allows life to flourish. For Urbit, what we wanted were developers, entrepreneurs, companies, DAOs, writers, creators, artists, all these people working with each other in strange, unpredictable, chaotic ways to create all kinds of beautiful structures, right? Something that feels good and emergent and full of novelty. And the thing was, is without something like this, Urbit just wasn't real in some fundamental way. You know, as long as Urbit was a, you know, an operating system that produced a single product, it would just be confused with that one product, right? Which is a big problem for a piece of technology. So we hoped, right, last October that what we'd get was an ecosystem. Well, you know, I'm happy to say these are some of the applications I use. These are the ones I know about. These aren't all of them. Like, I, I don't know how many there are. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't know about. It's actually, in the way that Urbit is built, it's not knowable uh, exactly how many there are. I have a reasonably good intuition of it. I think it's approaching 75. There's at least a dozen that have gone live this weekend. I can see a bunch of you in the audience that have been building these things. It's pretty remarkable, right? That was 11 months ago. And so before this, we had Tlon and we had Urbit. Right, there were a couple of other companies that were getting started, but the, the way that they collaborated hadn't really quite emerged yet. Right, there weren't these, these, these lines that existed. And, you know, in, again, not quite a year, uh, we have something that looks more like this. And if I forgot about you, I'm sorry. Um, there's, it's just getting hard to track. Um, I learn about new companies now almost as fast as I learn about new applications. We have all kinds of people that are just getting started on Urbit, building applications, turning them into companies. We have people coming from the outside that are going, you know what, I can actually build the thing that I want to build on Urbit. I can tie this into it, right? And we have many more people that have been around our community for years that have been watching Urbit's progress just like I was in 2020 and waiting for the right time to jump in and build something, right? They care about things in the world. They want society to change in some tangible way and they recognize that Urbit you know, if sufficiently realized, if actually real, if actually viable to use to build the thing I want to build, right, I could get there. All right, so at the beginning of this year, I became really preoccupied with this idea of launching Urban, you know, amidst like a shower of glory, flames, all of those things. And, you know, we were gonna, we we're gonna have 2022 be the year that Urban launches. And then I had this conversation with Galen yesterday where he pointed out something that should have been painfully obvious to me, which is that you can't launch Urbit. Like, Urbit is not a launchable thing, but it is obviously launched. When you go and look at the internet, it's not like it, there was one day that it was off and then another day that it was on, right? These things take time. And the way that something like Urbit launches is through the collective effort of people willing it into existence. So congratulations, you all did it. Yeah. 
So, you know, that brings me to Assembly 2022, right? The reason we're all here, what we're watching. Assembly 2022 is different than last year. Assembly in 2021 was a group of people getting up on stage, giving you something, right? Here's what we built, here's what you get. There's a better event. This is the year that it stops really being as much about Urbit. It becomes more about the things that people are using Urbit to build with. We've always talked about Urbit fading into the background, a piece of infrastructure that is used to power all kinds of things. And this is what we want to see happen. Right? This is what's happening. Right? An ecosystem comes together and builds all kinds of things, and that's what we begin to recognize. So you know, I hope that you know what I'm excited about, what we're all excited about, and you're gonna see what all kinds of other groups of people and individuals are excited about this weekend. And I want you to know that Urban is in a place where you can take your vision and you can actually bring it to life using this. So I hope you join us in making Urban, making computing more personal again. Thank you. <laughs>